These boxes are empty, by the way, in case you ever wondered. There's no name in it, no nothing. And I was wondering which boss was mine. I can't remember the last time I've had so much fun in a single day in Beirut. It's been great. And uh, I have an idea that I hope I can convince you in about 12 to 15 minutes. Have you ever wondered what happens in your brain when it slips to one of those altered states of consciousness? You know, when you dream or daydream, under hypnosis, when you meditate, or when you visit one of those chemically-fueled nirvanas that we can enter these days. <laughs> what happens in that three-pound pile of electrified biochemistry inside of your skull when it loses its grip on ordinary reality, whatever that is. I'm a neuroscientist, and I wonder about these sort of things. In fact, my university, believe it or not, pays me to wonder about these sort of things. <laughs> so I spent my time surfing the stream of consciousness, and I have a few observations, and I'm sharing with them today. But I got rules first, two of them. Not three, I got only two. Okay? <laughs> and some of the people won't like them, but I hope you can take them. Your brain can do many wonderful things, and you ought to be impressed. It can hope for the best, cry for help, love your mother, rethink a decision, do the hula hoop, <laughs> be a proud citizen, look for itself, fake an orgasm. Well, some can, others a bit more tricky. But unless you're away with the pixies or believe your noggin is made out of some heavenly goo, all there is, people, and that's it. Your mind, your soul, your hopes, your dreams, your emotions is about a cantaloupe-sized heap of meat crickling with electricity inside of your skull, and that's it. And if you come with me this far towards a natural explanation of altered states of consciousness, you can just as well go a step further. And that step further is that altered states of consciousness are nothing special. When you seem to catch a glimpse of these alternative mental universes, it has to be an ordinary process for which there ought to be a natural explanation. There's nothing sacrosanct about altered states of consciousness. So this is the rule number one. When we look for mechanisms, there's no time for the lunatic fringe. And there's a lot. There's a lot of fluff when it comes to altered states of consciousness. Rule number two. And this is actually a fascinating piece of myopic thinking. Actually, none of us knows where it comes from and how it ever could possibly spread this far and this wide. But I'm sure you've heard it, that we only use 10% of our brain. What? What would 23% look like or 42%? And what's your baseline? Einstein, your granny? We have no idea what 100% would be like. Think of it this way. Your brain is a seriously costly piece of machinery. Not using 90% of it, just so in case one day you finally switch on the television or your Game Boy or the iPad and walk down to the library, pick up a book and read something clever, violates the principles of evolution. Extra brain space, at least that much of it, is unevolvable. It's just simply too costly after having poured some common sense lubricant on the matter, we can start on the educational download. Your brain is not what you think it is. It's kind of like the internet. It's a fact pandemonium. It's a society, a society of neurons. And there are lots of neurons that are very powerful. And just like in society, they were born that way, most of them. And some neurons are not that powerful. Okay? And they form alliances and allegiance, networks, circuits, and they try to get to power, which means they try to get to consciousness. A ragtag collection of modules, each one designed to do a particular thing. It's pandemonium, but at some point, it self-organizes. Can I go back here? Yeah, I can. 
That's the patchwork. It has a hierarchy to it. At the very bottom of the mental totem pole is the brainstem, a very basic piece of hardware. It does some very crude things like foraging for food and reflexes, the knee-jerk reflex or erections, that sort of thing. Okay? If you have damage there, usually that wipes out consciousness altogether, your ability to conscious. That's, by the way, why the permit is inverted. It only takes a few neurons, a few critical neurons, a few million actually, and the lights go off everywhere. The next stop is the limbic system, which is um, a basic upgrade of learning and mimicking. The things become only interesting at the level of the cortex and at the sort of snazziest piece of cortical real estate, the prefrontal cortex, the part of the cortex right behind your forehead. That is where higher cognitive functions happen, as we call them. Full-fledged consciousness, the kind of consciousness that you have right now, only happens when your brain runs on all four cylinders and fires out of all pistons. Okay? The prefrontal cortex computes some very fancy mental faculties, the kinds of things that make us, us, and not some other chimp. Working memory, your ability to manipulate information online. In fact, that the beginning of my sentence, you can remember it, so that the end of my sentence still makes any sense to you. Sustained attention, we're the only animals who do this. It's an amazing trick that you can sustain attention to a biologically irrelevant stimulus. That's what I am to you right now. I provide no biological value, no food, no sex, no money, no nothing. <laughs> but you pay attention to me. Try to get a chimpanzee sit through a five-hour Wagner opera. Although that might be tough on me too. <laughs> Think about it. You can perform a very fancy trick we call mental time travel. You can live in the past. You can project yourself into the future. Displacement. We are the only animals on this planet who can work for a paycheck at the end of the month. Try that with the next chimp. You won't have any success on that. We can self-reflect. In fact, we have a sense of self that is a very complicated computation that you can tell the difference between yourself and other. Uh, free will, actually the sense of free will. We compute the sense of free will, that we think that we have free will, which is independent whether we actually have free will. Okay? Abstract thinking. Now you may think that there's an endless variety to the kinds of experiences that you can have in an altered state of consciousness, but that isn't so. If you take um, a meditating yogi on some Himalayan mountaintop, for instance, or um, you take the kaleidoscopic images that you can have when you drop acid. Or um, take a Sufi, a whirling dervish, who connects to his god. Or if that is too esoteric for you, you just think of your dreams, that nightly slideshow of the bazaar that you have every night. Tales from the hallucination zones, these sort of interpretations, they are nuggets of pure gold for the connoisseurs of alternatives. They love to tell you the interpretation of what they feel when they go to an altered state of consciousness. But they do nothing, nothing for us. If we want a mechanistic explanation, we better look at these higher cognitive functions I've been talking about and see whether psychonauts still register them when they travel to a different mental time zone. And then, when you do that, you see regularities. Working memory, that good trick, gone. Sustained attention is gone. In fact, you enter a sort of a la-la land where you drift in and out of some improbable scenarios involving you, Angelina Jolie, and some Hawaiian beach. <laughs> Actually, I don't know why I came up with that just now. You have a sense of timelessness in an altered state of consciousness, like your dreams. You no longer register the ticking of the clock. You can no longer figure time. You have a complete collapse of the mental space-time continuum. 
This amounts to, and I've called this, a mental singularity. In an altered state of consciousness, you exist in a single point. In fact, you're caught in it, in the here and now. And you can no longer extract yourself from that here and now. It's impossible. One of the most interesting things that happens in an altered state of consciousness is that the sense of self disintegrates. If you're a mountain climber and you're really high, altitude-wise, you may feel some <laughs> strange unity with the mountains around you, with nature. Or some people dissolve into the universal ocean, or they become one with the void. Or if you're at home on your couch and you just dropped some psychoactive mushrooms, you become one with the ashtray. <laughs> or you merge with the wallpaper. <laughs> or that spaghetti monster. <laughs> Whatever is your thing. And here comes the clincher. And the clincher requires for you that you flip your thinking. And some of you will not like it. You've always been told, or you've always thought, that altered states of consciousness are higher states of consciousness. Just ask your flower power, new age yoga instructor who tells you that the mind can center your energy lines. <laughs> or um, ask your friendly neighborhood voodoo priest who does a dance, a rain dance, to connect and reach out to God. Or some Buddhist monk who sits on a hilltop and is just three meditation light years of shy of enlightenment. They all tell you, they all tell you the same, that when they come back from the other side, that somehow they connect to the great beyond, that they can see the meaning and the purpose of the universe, what in its core is all about, its true essence. And that's rather unlikely, given one, the phenomenology that I've been describing, and this hierarchy of brain function, that inverted pyramid I showed you earlier, you will have noticed that altered states of consciousness, the hallmark of them is the subtraction of all the mental faculties that make us so special in the animal kingdom. The idea I want to convince you of is called transient hyperfrontality. Transient because all altered states of consciousness come back out into a normal state of consciousness. Your dreams end, and so does your trip, whatever it was that fueled it. Okay? Hyperfrontality means that the very pinnacle of human evolution, the prefrontal cortex, must be downregulated, which you lose these higher cognitive functions that make us so special. Whenever the brain is under assault, whenever it changes, is modus operandi, it needs to hunker down and it needs to concentrate on the basics. It is kind of like a sinking ship. As soon as the ship starts sinking, it needs to throw overboard ballast. And just like in an altered state of consciousness, the deeper and the deeper that you go, the more ballast you have to throw overboard. And you start at the luxury items. Throw the captain overboard first. At the very last comes the rum. You start from the top of the hierarchy, from the frontal cortex. That's why this is called transient hyperfrontality. The mystical oneness, the merging with the spaghetti monster, comes simply because you no longer have the computational capacity to compute the difference between you and the other. So you become one with them. And whatever is around you, or whatever God you believe in, that's the one you merge with. The calm and the serenity that comes from being in the here and now is simply because you can no longer do the fancy mental footwork required to extract yourself from the here and now because that takes a lot of brain power. You can no longer worry about the stock market crash and what that does to your retirement fund because you're so decorticated that you cannot understand consequences removed in time. This is very difficult. Just ask anybody who smokes to try to understand consequences removed in time. It requires a lot of intelligence. 
states of consciousness, or everybody has their right to do whatever they want to do. Altered states of consciousness, all of them, all altered states of consciousness are lower states of consciousness. You connect to nothing but your own reduced mind. Now, as you can imagine, this theory of mine has not been too popular among a certain segment of the population. <laughs> Some people find the idea repugnant beneath the dignity of the mystical experience. And that's all right if you want to hold on to some sort of stone age, medieval sense of spirituality. But, and it is okay. But I think you will find this only counterintuitive if you hold on to the idea that in those special moments when you catch a glimpse of some parallel mental universe, in those very moments the mind somehow somehow can transcend the machinery of the brain, become a ghost in the machine, right above the fray, and enter some sort of Platonian world of eternal truth and beauty. And that's also fine. As long as you know, when you fly a kite for a theory like this, as far as mechanisms is concerned, you're off the reservation. And away with the pixies. Okay? Thank you.